Hey everyone, Ahmed here, and today we're going to be talking about deep venous thrombosis. Let's break this term down. So we're talking about deep veins here. You know, veins that think about their existence, why they were chosen to be veins and not arteries, not those shallow veins. Okay, okay, kidding aside, we're thinking of a thrombotic clot in the deep veins of the lower extremities like the iliac, popliteal, and superficial femoral veins. Wait, superficial? You just made a lame joke about deep veins, Ahmed. Yeah, this is one of those annoying things in medicine. The superficial femoral vein is actually a deep vein, despite its name. Okay, unlike arteries, these aren't clots that develop from atherosclerosis. So if it's not atheromas, what makes someone develop clots in their veins? The development of a DVT happens through the Virchow's triad. That is venous stasis, hypercoagulability, and endothelial damage. In other words, you're getting inappropriate activation of the coagulation cascade. So now that we know the triad, we can work out risk factors that predispose someone to DVT. A prime example of venous stasis is prolonged immobility. This could be due to paralysis, like someone with Guillain-Barre syndrome or ALS, or it could be due to orthopedic trauma, like someone with a femur fracture. Hey, that would probably also cause endothelial damage. Or it could be simply due to prolonged travel. Another cause of venous stasis is chronic venous insufficiency, or varicose veins. As for endothelial damage, Trauma, surgery, and smoking can all damage the endothelium. Okay, can you think of some conditions that cause hypercoagulability? Right on, so malignancies, sepsis, genetic thrombophilia disorders like factor V lidin and antithrombin 3 deficiency. Also, you can lose the natural anticoagulant, antithrombin 3, in the urine in nephrotic syndrome, causing hypercoagulability. Okay, two tough questions ahead. Which specific nephrotic syndrome causes this hypercoagulability and what does it usually present with? If you got it, pause, pat yourself on the back, all right? So membranous nephropathy is most commonly associated with hypercoagulability and it classically presents as renal vein thrombosis. Great integration there. Okay. Some autoimmune disorders like lupus can also make the blood hypercoagulable. Other causes of hypercoagulability include high estrogen states. This could be something natural, like in pregnancy, or it could be acquired, like estrogen-containing oral contraceptive pills or hormone replacement therapy. Interestingly, pregnancy can also cause venous stasis. Do you know how? Yeah, so the gravid uterus can compress the iliac veins, causing stasis of blood flow. So as you can see, there are many risk factors and they can contribute in more than one way within this triad. But this just gives you an idea. Okay, so how does DVT present? So patients come with a unilateral, painful red swelling of the affected leg. Important differentials to keep on your mind include cellulitis, which can also present similarly, and a popliteal Baker cyst. Do you remember what a Baker cyst was associated with? Yeah, so arthritis of the knee, especially osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis. To make the diagnosis, use a compression ultrasound with Doppler of the extremity in question. Compression means that you're literally pressing the ultrasound probe down on the leg. See, veins are thin-walled and are easily compressible. But when there's a clot, the vein becomes non-compressible. And that's one of the hallmark diagnostic findings of UVT. Doppler just means that in addition to conventional ultrasound, you're also assessing blood flow. You see those red flamey colors? Yeah, that's Doppler. Okay, how would you treat DVT? Patients with DVT are anticoagulated with unfractionated or low molecular weight heparin followed by warfarin. Do you remember why we sequence treatment like this? So, warfarin inhibits the synthesis of factors 2, 7, 9, 10, as well as protein CNS in the liver. Protein CNS are anticoagulant factors, while the rest are procoagulant. 
But the thing is, is that the half-life of protein CNS is shorter than the remaining factors. So for a short period of time, when starting warfarin therapy, the body is actually in a hypercoagulable state. We don't want that now, do we? So, we give heparin for a couple of days until warfarin completes its effect. Wait a second, how do I know when warfarin completes its effect? Is it going to give me a signal or something? Well, it usually takes three to five days, but if you really want to make sure, you measure the prothrombin time, or PT, also referred to as the International Normalized Ratio, or INR. Once the INR is around two to three, you can stop heparin and resume warfarin therapy. Okay, but why do we need to treat DVT anyway? Well, sure, it can rarely be limb-threatening, but the main reason is because DVTs can cause life-threatening pulmonary emboli. The risk factors for PE and DVT are essentially the same, so you often hear them clumped together as venous thromboembolism, or VTE. That's all, folks. If you liked the video, please give it a thumbs up. Until next time, goodbye.